We're back with another episode of the Inspiring Women in CX podcast, a series usually dedicated to real talk conversations between women in customer experience and technology. This series, we're putting some of our awesome allies in the hot seat too. No longer rehashing the same old conversations. In series seven, you can expect us to challenge the status quo on CX topics, provocative discourse, and naturally plenty of healthy debate. I'll be your host, Claire Musket, and in today's episode, I'll be talking to one seriously inspiring lady from Finland. She's the CEO of Sharute, the first customer experience agency in Finland, the leader of the Global Customer Experience Professionals Association Finland, and also one of the CXPA's founding members. With over 25 years of experience advising large organizations and brands in different industries, she's passionately championing CX in the Nordics, the Caribbean, Southeast Asia, and beyond. Let me introduce you to today's inspiring guest, Serta Felicia. Hi, Serta. Hi, Claire. How are you? I'm really well. Welcome to the Inspiring Women in CX podcast. Thank you. Lovely to be here. And thank you to everybody who's listening or watching along wherever you are. So we're going to drive straight into the podcast as we always do. So Serta, I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you found your way into the Women in CX community and the kind of things you've been up to since you joined us. Well, uh, the first time I heard, heard about it was when we were having these discussions with you on, on CX Care, so our so, sort of yeah. a small community back, back, back way back when. With Ian so, Golding, yeah. I yeah, recorded yeah. a podcast episode with him recently yeah. and we talked about that time um, during the pandemic when we were all united by Ian as self-employed CX consultants trying to navigate how to get through that difficult time. So yeah, I remember meeting you there. <laughs> yeah, so I think that that's where, when I heard about it for the first time and, and when you were talking about the, well, not struggle, but the challenges about uh, getting up, it up and running, basically. Yeah and been following it uh, ever since and then um, funnily enough uh, when I went to um, Barbados as uh, my whole family uh, moved over there a year and a half ago or, or thereabouts uh, you told me about uh, uh, Sam who's in Trin- Trinidad and Tobago mm-hmm. and, and we met with her and she was she was very very loud and and, and was very much recommending uh, uh, women in CX and joining them. Mm-hmm. I had been, of course, pondering about it ever since the beginning, but always too busy to do anything about it uh, mm. before that. But yeah, then then it felt uh, like the right thing to do at the at that time to to find more people. I've been always sort of a community builder and, and trying to be involved in different kinds of CX communities. So I have a background in in uh, as, a, as a co-founder in for the CXPA, the Customer Experience Professionals Association. And bringing it to Finland back in the day, like 2013, we started our uh, meetings and, and live live events uh, there. And then through through my career, I have been looking for more and more international uh, networks and people who are doing these uh, same things abroad. So uh, Women in CX was a natural uh, kind of uh, community for that. I think. Yeah. Yeah, and of course, um, we, women rule. Women rule. So, <laughs> <laughs> of course, we do. And yeah, you've done a few things, haven't you? I know that you came and did a webinar for us recently. Uh, yes, I did on on the same benchmark. Uh, we did a, a webinar on, on trying to. Uh, it's 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 a same benchmark is really a study and and survey that uh, tool that we have uh, created for for TXPA in Finland back in the day when we started and wanted people to have an understanding of uh, where they are at the moment in, for their customer management efforts and also to learn from each other. So that is something that uh, we have been running now for 10 years and uh, in, in Finland and this is the third year that we're doing it uh, internationally. So we wanted to share that uh, tool with everybody in, in this community as well because it's it's really helpful to to help uh, people understand uh, what others in in the profession are doing at the moment. Yeah, so you've already mentioned about 10 things about your career journey, even in that first <laughs> instance. But do you want to share a little bit more about your uh, career and how you ended up where you are today? Uh, sure, sure. Um, well, I, I was always uh, going to become a journalist, in fact, 
and I, I my my background is in journalism and I used to work for for the Finnish broadcasting company and for a little while for for the BBC as well and uh, the Radio France Internationale as I was doing studies in Paris in, in the Sorbonne University and um, at the time when I was working for the Finnish broadcasting company I had a very very uh, forward-looking let's say uh, uh, boss who asked me that, hey, Sirte, you, you, you're into this computer stuff. Uh, would you like to help us uh, create this intranet for the Finnish broadcasting company? And we actually went ahead and, and developed that. And we were one of the first ones in, in, I don't know, the whole world, I guess, but at least in Finland to come up with an intranet. And then the internet services came uh, shortly after. And, and then I got headhunted to uh, Accenture, or it was called Anderson Consulting at the time, but it changed names whilst, whilst I was there for to found a an Internet Center of Excellence, which which was something something that was quite uh, spearheading at that at the time. Mm -hmm. Doing, uh, if you remember, something called WAP uh, mobile services, which is like a very old mobile services at the, at, the, uh, at this moment. Nobody, nobody really knows what they were, but at the time it was very, very uh, uh, new. Uh, and then again, I got uh, uh, headhunted to another uh, company uh, called Visual, Visual Systems. And uh, I ran a design team for quite a few years there, I think eight or nine years uh, before joining Fjord, Fjord Interactive. And, and, and when uh, then it was time for, for Fjord to become uh, uh, merged to Accenture. I decided that maybe it's time for me to found my own or uh, my own company at that time. So in 2010, I created the first uh, customer experience design agency called Shilute, which I'm still uh, running to, to this date. And that's kind of my, my career in short. <laughs> And now for a quick word from one of our sponsors. We are proud to be supported by Kantar, the world's leading evidence-based insight and consulting company. Kantar CX helps clients define customer and employee experience strategies, better understand their customers via measurement, and in turn, improve business outcomes, driving true commercial ROI. To find out more about Kantar CX practice, please visit the sponsor links on the homepage of womenincx.community. Now back to the episode. Also, and there must have been some barriers that you overcame or challenges that you experienced on the way. Um, what would you say one of the main barriers or challenges you've overcome to become the woman you are today? <laughs> that's a, that's some question. Um, I would say that when we first started in Finland uh, running customer experience. Uh, related activities, nobody knew what customer experience really was. And uh, when I went, I was asked to become a co-founder for the uh, CXPA, I went to the meeting, uh, the first meeting and in the US and we were all having this uh, breakfast meeting, breakfast uh, at the table and everybody uh, from, from the US, they started saying that, uh, how many people do you have in customer experience roles? And, there was somebody who said 80 and the other one who said 200 and I don't know the numbers. And, and then, then it was my time. And I was like, I think there is one person uh, in addition to me, to myself, who has on their business cards, the words customer, customer and experience one uh, after the other. So it was really something uh, quite new at the time. And that was why I specifically wanted to uh, bring CXPA to Finland as well, to, to kind of uh, lift the uh, the domain and the, the practices to a totally different level. So for quite a few years, we had people who were very uh, alone, and I think they still are in different various organizations working on customer experience. Nowadays, it's it's become mainstream, and and people know what, what we're talking about when we're talking about customer experience and employee experience, for that matter. But at that point, it was really, really. Uh, something, uh, let's say, new. And uh, yeah, it wasn't exactly uh, uh, easy easy to talk about customer experience because I had to become this evangelist uh, to, to even talk, start talking about it to everybody else. 
And do you think CX evangelism is still effective in today's environment where businesses want a much harder edge to the commercial metrics? I think it totally has space, space still in, in businesses and, and like uh, public organizations as well. Uh, maybe the evangelism, has... I mean, like to, to be an evangelist as opposed to being a team or group of people or even individual that helps a business to deliver results rather than evangelizing CX? <laughs> hmm. Not sure if I understand your question there correctly, but I, I think that there are still very many organizations, at least in Finland, where, where people are do need to be uh, having these ambassadors and, and, and spread the word within those organizations because uh, it should be everybody's role nowadays uh, and, and all, all the teams should be thinking about their customers and, and how customer experience can best be managed. But the thing is that uh, uh, companies don't yet necessarily have this common framework to talk about customer experience and the common terminology. So, so they might be customer centric as such, let's say, uh, but they don't necessarily do things in a managed way so that every time that you are facing your customer, the customer would get the same level of service uh, and, and get the, you know, the CX delivered that, that you are, have been planning for. So it's, mm -hmm. it's become, I would say that what has happened is that uh, people very much started from uh, voice of customer programs and we were specifically talking about measuring customer experience. And, and nowadays it's more about putting that into practice and, and uh, of course still the voice of customer programs are very important and, and people have understood that it's more about the processes and the roles and the data that runs through voice of customer programs and, and actually doing actions based on what you hear from your customers but it's the, the I would say that the main focus of customer experience management has uh, shifted to towards uh, getting an organizational culture that supports uh, this thinking and, and getting everybody on board with that. Interesting well I know listeners to the podcast will know that I disagree with quite a lot of that but hey <laughs> this is your episode. So um thinking back to October 2023 you flew across to the UK to deliver a Lego serious workshop play sorry Lego serious play workshop as part of our conference for anyone who doesn't know what Lego serious play is please can you tell the audience a little bit more about um, it as a topic and also how it would be helpful to CX leaders of course uh, Lego serious play is first of all it's great fun and it brings in un it unlocks the creativity with, with inside of us uh, for us to be able to better deliver uh, customer experience uh, design and uh, and thinking and and catalyze it, it works as a catalyst for all those discussions that we are having within teams and and organizations about so is it like experience. so is it like a facilitated workshop using Lego or like let's keep it really simple like what actually is lego serious play <laughs> yeah it's a faci facilitated workshop uh where the facilitator who is a trained lego serious play facilitator uh puts forward these uh challenges to people who are joining the workshop and depending of course on what the challenges are within the company that have we have been uh planning to discuss on that in that workshop uh they uh the participants get to build their own models from Lego, Lego bricks. And then it's mostly about storytelling, about telling what your model is all about, where you're actually uh, putting all of your thinking uh, about this specific topic and you're explaining your thoughts and ideas about, that, about those. And then everybody around the table gets to explain their own models with their stories. and. And the idea is that everybody's in a safe space to share their thoughts. And uh, we come up then afterwards uh, with a common model where everybody has uh, their, their view, point of view is uh, expressed and uh, nobody has uh, like the right or wrong answers in, in, in the workshops. So it's a, it's a discussion uh, 
it's a media that helps discussions take place and also the idea is that when you when you get uh, into play you get into this state of flow where you you just give everything that you have in your mind about things and and, and uh, yeah it, it really is a facilitation methodology uh, but it's something like uh, on top of your normal uh, facilitation and normal deliverables that you would uh, anyhow be creating from projects as, as such. So instead of having, you know, this uh, post-it post uh, where you have to come up with the one, one word to rule them all and, and explain everything that you wanted to say, instead you get to, to give more of yourself and more of your thinking to everybody else. Could you give an example of like what a challenge might be and how it might be facilitated, like a real life example to help to bring it to life? Sure. Um, that's one that comes to my mind is actually about employee experience. Uh, what we did with a uh, media company was that they had two different uh, departments coming together and they wanted to uh, discuss their expectations and, and uh, how they, they wanted to get their data engineers to talk to, to each other about how do they put these two departments together. So some of the challenges were about these things that that what do you uh, what expectations from from your colleagues, uh, what have you uh, previously uh, liked about the way of working in in your previous organization and, and things like that, and then when everybody gets to say their word uh, about these things, then they come up came up with a, a common plan on how they want to uh, mm -hmm. move forward with things. Mm -hmm. nice and I suppose as an expert facilitator um what would you say like the top five skills of a facilitator are in customer experience how would you boil it down to so what are the most important things for our audience um to know to be a great facilitator well I would say that firstly you have to at, at, at to have a lot of understanding of the background about the uh, um kind of situation that you're facilitating and, and really need to plan with, with your clients uh, what, what the outcomes are that they want to uh, get from this uh, facilitation and, and these workshops so mm -hmm. that you really deliver on the on the promise and the expectations I'd say. Another thing I think is is that you need to make it nice, uh, fun, fun and engaging for everybody who's participating so you don't have people who are you know leaning yes. back so therefore mm -hmm. i think lego series play is a very good methodology because we call them uh, uh lean forward meetings or even people in, in general many people they, they stand in those meetings because they want to be the first ones to get you know their hands on lego and and it becomes a very very much of an act like a energizing and activating uh as, an, as, as such of course, you have to uh, be able also to uh, look very, um, uh, how to say, make, make sure that everybody but they gets to uh, uh, have their say. So, so uh, that you need to be very balanced in 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 that uh, facilitation, in that sense that you get also the people who are in general maybe a little bit more quiet and more reserved to to, to telling their. Uh, ideas to to get them to join as well and participate actively mm. and um, so, there's always that one person in the room isn't there who either like wants to take center stage or is always like putting their hand up and um o like taking over in mm -hmm. workshop scenarios isn't there or even like in training um so how do you help um, I suppose, like minimize that person's involvement. What kind of tips could you share about how to facilitate difficult people in either meetings or workshops? For sure. Um, especially with uh, Lego Series Play, we don't have that as much because we give as much time to everybody to tell their uh, stories. So it, it's uh, kind of inbaked into the methodology that, right. that nobody, nobody gets like in front of everybody else. Uh, the other thing is that uh, if you have uh, people from different levels of the organization, it, it makes uh, everything quite, um, everybody on the same level, that there are no mm. hierarchies as such. So yeah. you don't need to kind of uh, 
give more space to somebody who's I don't know a director of something mm-hmm. uh, but but you all get to have your say so I think the, the methodology helps a lot in in that of course uh, it's a question of, of making sure how like how, how you um, involve everybody how you take eye contact with with people uh, how, how much space you give to those people it, mm-hmm. there is a limit where you need to say that okay let's move forward and, and and then get somebody else to to speak mm, that's interesting so just to summarize that the way that you design the workshop is super important to avoid the complication of the most important person in the room um mm-hmm. being deferred to so like creating exercises where everybody gets the same amount of time to speak and exactly. um ensuring that the time is adhered to I know like um Olga Patapsova we did a um, leaders group workshop together and like she actually had a timer and when the timer was mm-hmm. done then that was your mm-hmm. time over um so there are some yeah, more that, practical things aren't there that's um, exactly what we have also in Lego series play that everybody has say two minutes uh to to tell their story so when that time is up then then that's done yeah. and they, <laughs> they get the next one up Sorry to interrupt your listening, but I just wanted to take a moment to tell you a little bit more about Wix. We're the world's first online membership community for women in customer experience. Our mission is clear, and that's to unleash the power of women to lead the future of human-centered business. Working in CX can feel lonely at times. We're often single-handedly trying to change the way organizations think and behave about customers. On our paid platform, you can discover a vibrant tribe of fellow female professionals, find support from knowledgeable peers, learn best practices from experts and practitioners, and be inspired to up your game through leading edge CX and EX thinking. If you feel like you aren't making enough progress with your CX objectives, are unsure about what your next move looks like, or are struggling to achieve your career ambitions, you're not alone. To learn more about membership, see how women are progressing personally and professionally with the support of the number one community in CX, you can apply to join us today by visiting www.womenincx.community forward slash membership. I really hope I get to see you there soon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cool, cool. Um, uh, next question. Something else that I've been seeing you talk about actually quite a lot on LinkedIn recently is this thing called machine customers, which mm-hmm. sounds very intriguing. Um, and also I've seen you starting to um, think about what the implications are going to be on the future of CX with the arrival of these machine customers. So for the benefit of the audience who may have different levels of understanding of what a machine customer is, should we start there? Can you explain what is a machine customer? Of course. So machine customers are something that uh, I would say say they they have they have been uh, there has been talk about machine customers also previously, but since last year when ChatGPT came out, it it became obvious that this is something that's uh, going to uh, be in our in our uh, business much much sooner than later. And <clears throat> really, uh, Gartner says that it's we're talking about the third like a trillion dollar business so i looked that up it's one with 13 zeros so <laughs> quite quite a quite a big big a lot of zeros uh, some there yeah a lot of zeros but but to put that into context it's twice as big a uh, thing as as business uh, goes as the uh, introduction of e-commerce so if you think about that for a moment it, it is something that uh, we should really take we should all take very seriously and at the moment, what I, I think is that everybody's really looking uh, forward to uh, using AI, artificial intelligence to, to kind of, we're all lazy, you know? So, so people, people are looking on, on how to utilize AI to do less work, to how, how could we, uh, I don't know, make offers so that, that, that we need to as little time into it as possible. Whereas instead you should, you know, Take this, uh, I don't know, ten percent or how many percent it is, uh, more efficient work t- work time uh, usage that you have into uh, your customers, and, and thinking about how could you be doing more for them, and how could you be, you know, doing the right things for them instead of thinking that how do how do I make this as easy as possible for myself. Mm-hmm. So I think as a CX 
the ex-professional that we should be looking into that. But coming back to your original question, mm -hmm. what are machine customers? <laughs> Sorry, uh, they are small small agents uh, that uh, are AI based. So, for instance, for for the last year, what I have been doing is that I've been you know learning Python coding and and getting to the GitHub's and other open source uh, codes and and putting installing these agents that can go out there on the on the web and uh, do all of my bidding and uh, shopping for me basically so what an agent could do is they could take for of say for for uh, member family uh, see what their special you know de dietary requirements are and, and plan uh, whatever food they want to have during a week then go on to, to an online shop, uh, make the order for all the ingredients that you need for these recipes, and then even have them delivered to your door, looking at your calendar that, okay, you're go certainly going to be there at that time when, when it's being delivered. So mm -hmm. putting all of these things uh, together, just by me telling them that I want this done, you know, basically, or they could be uh, sitting on a, on a on a call where you have to otherwise be waiting for your like customer service agent to come and uh, uh, get, help you help you out. Or one very good example is what I would really love to do with the agents uh, lately was when my credit card expired and and I had the same credit card and I had forty different internet services where I needed to update the credit card details. Mm -hmm. So if I instead could have just told my agent to go ahead and, and do it, I would have been happy to give it all the you know credentials that it needed for the different uh, internet services. Which of course people will always say that that okay then it's going to be a you know like a information security issue and blah blah blah. But this is something that every single company will need to solve somehow. So I think that there will be a way when this will be possible uh, quite shortly. And, and uh, nowadays uh, with GPTs uh, that came out a week, well, some time ago, uh, then, then it's possible to create these uh, agents uh, totally with using natural language. You don't need to be a programmer anymore. So when when uh, sending out these machine customers to do do to do your work is as easy as you know me saying to telling you to. Uh, Kindly do something for me. I don't see a point why people wouldn't be using them. And again, coming back to the Gartner uh, statistics, they say that uh, in 2025, four out of 10 people will have experimented with uh, machine customers. And in 2027, half of us will be utilizing them in our daily, daily uh, lives. So it's going to be probably going to happen even sooner than, than that. Uh, this, these predictions were from this spring, uh, spring 2023, so. Wow, I think that's it's exciting. To be, yeah. So just to play this back to you. Um, so what we're saying is that due to large language models like chat GPT, the artificial intelligence required to be able to have conversations with humans or other chatbots is now coming to a place where there are businesses building assistant services is that correct yeah well actually there there are subscription services a few of them already that uh, do you have any instance, names that we can check yeah, out do, do not pay for instance is a service where you can have an agent go for you instead of you uh, to a telco for instance and uh, negotiate a new subscription for you and they they just and do it and that's a machine doing that, that is a machine yeah and that come that that's where i come to my next point is that uh, th that's going to totally change the employee experience because up till now we have all been thinking of ways to you know how do we make our customers feel as good or whatever the the feeling has been that we have been striving towards uh, as possible. Whereas now, if the customer is going to be a machine, 
all they are going to care about is is efficiency and and getting things easily and you know being able to do deliver to their masters as as fast as possible and and so there is no no such need uh for empathy and and, and all of that and uh, then that problem comes from the fact that say custom if, if you have a customer uh, service representative who's talking to a machine uh, we are at the point where you don't necessarily even identify it as a as a machine if you're talking you know via voice and and you could be talking to this machine and not know that it's not it's not a real person of course there's always a customer behind them but uh, the actual interface that you're going to be talking with might very well be a machine mm. yeah are there so any that's... more brand names you can mention so any more services that we should be uh... watching out for we could maybe try ourselves uh, I can get back to you on, on that, but we can put them in the show notes uh, later on. There's quite some, quite some already, but the problem is that uh, this is so new that uh, I think that people are not uh, really um, thinking about how this is going to change uh, the businesses as we know them and, and the processes. So what we... What we should be doing as customer experience professionals is un trying to understand how this is going to change the customer journey. So we need to design for machine customers. This so there will be a new kind of almost as a as a discipline to to design for for machine customers all these customer journeys, machine customer experiences. I, I I'd like to I, I think I, we should call them. If, and, and think about, for instance, voice of customer that should you be, still be sending all of these VOC uh, question, like questionnaires to machines? Or if you do, then what should you be asking them? Is it more about efficiency or, or you know, different things, probably different things than from your uh, human customers? But, if, but in your statistics, you quoted Gartner by 2025, say mm -hmm. that four out of 10 people would have experimented with machine customers but if there mm -hmm. are no kind of like brands and services out there in the mainstream how is that going to happen at that speed they, they are coming you probably uh, have been looking how how fast everything has like developers have been developing things uh even for chat GP, since chat GPT came out now that uh it is possible with uh, natural language to create GPTs, which are AI agents. Uh, anybody and everybody can do that. And uh, OpenAI is also going to open this store for GPT store. So basically, like a same thing as as Apple's like Apple's uh, App Store, where you can get any agent you like. If if you if you still feel like not not so confident about creating those agents yourself. So that is something that is going to happen. Oh, I didn't con connect that together. So you say an open AI is building a store where you can buy an agent yeah. that you can program to do what you want. I see. So that's where it's going to start. Okay. So so, okay. so a while back, uh, they, they ro rolled out these uh, GPTs uh, where anybody can create their own uh, GPT, which is an agent. And, and you can just give it a name and, and give it like a like a prompt but with natural language that please do this for me so the 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 space of development is so fast now that uh there's no nothing to to kind of hinder from or it from happening now yeah i i guess i'm like most people probably are thinking of like experience of chat gpt is like within the platform where you can ask it to do things, but it can mm -hmm. create either visual or written formats. Mm -hmm. How is it going to be able to like reach out and sit on a phone call or like, I don't know, like be out there interfacing with a chat bot? Like, how's that going to happen? <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's technically, the uh, te technically, uh, I wouldn't be the technical, real technical person to explain this. Sorry about that, but, uh, We've have had a lot, for a long time already this something called in ChatGPT called the plugins. So plugins were the first uh, version, let's say, where uh, service providers could provide the possibility for uh, customers to to I don't know book flights or 
do things like that. And, and uh, these integrations were also already there in, in baked. But there, the idea was that it would all, always be uh, based on the service provider, whether they wanted to create this plugin and, and then offer this service. Whereas this is going to be the other way around where uh, customers are going to be creating them themselves. So they can uh, then work on, on whatever they want to integrate uh, on, on these uh, GPTs. That's a really important point then. This isn't going to be something mm. that businesses can choose to plug into or not. It's going to mm. happen from the consumer end and exactly exactly will act and behave to all intents and purposes like a customer so i just want to think this through a little bit more um around i get customers programming or asking requesting the mm -hmm. um llm agent to do something for them like get me a doctor's appointment there's like mm -hmm. things with Alexa voice that you can do today, aren't there? That can like do mm -hmm. things in your calendar. Um, yeah. The voice assistants have kind of started doing some of these things like getting a hairdressing appointment, canceling appointments, those kinds of things already exist. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so that's us interfacing through voice with an assistant. Uh, I suppose like today, like, it kind of happens the other way around, doesn't it? Where humans are interacting with robot agents, whether that be a chatbot or an IVR or um, something similar. I guess I, I'm intrigued in what you said about then imagining like it being the other way around, the agent talking to a robot rather than the customer talking to a robot in a service interaction. How do you see that working? So yeah, sorry, we just had to take a quick break there because Serta's AirPods failed. So I'm going to ask this question again. Um, so we already today have human robot interaction with AIs, right? So at the consumer end, we have interaction with voice assistants who at the moment are able to do things like book appointments, cancel appointments, um, order um things through amazon for example like repeat orders um so this i kind of internet of things and voice assistant technology in the home like kind of already exists right or even like siri go and google this for me so we've got a little bit of it happening today um on the kind of customer business end we've got customers interacting with robots um in the form of ais as chatbots or perhaps like the more um, advanced a IVRs. What I can't get my head around is imagining this now being flipped on its head where human agents in a contact center are then having to interact with robots <laughs> as the customer. Um, and even though that happens today, the other way around, that just seems like a really alien concept <laughs> because, you know, I think... In, if you think about like complicated service interactions eventually the human will give up probably won't they they'll get so frustrated with the situation they'll put down the phone but the robot is not going to give up they have infinite time they don't have emotions they're not going to get angry they'll keep going until like they get what they want resolved right in theory mm -hmm. um so so i think like you know you said raise the question there's this like experience design element for technology around how would you service that differently? I'm assuming you'd want to funnel that for a chatbot to talk to a chatbot then, wouldn't you? You want them to, to be like interacting away and keep the human kind of reserved for where empathy is required and, you know, helping to resolve someone's query where there's a lot of emotion involved, maybe. Mm. Yeah, um, the, but the, also... Uh, but also I think the point you said around like um, what's important to customers versus what's going to be important to robots, that's super interesting because actually the outcome of the contact is going to be the most important thing, isn't it? Like, which uh -huh. it should be already, but we have made this very kind of complicated version of voice to customer and surveys that um, are more self-serving than they are actually in serving the customer. So yeah, I just would love to hear you um, describe a little bit more about 
what you think that future looks like and what CX leaders should be thinking about now in order to ensure they're ready for the arrival of the machine customers. Right. That is exactly what I'm kind of like focusing right now is that uh, boards and, and members of boards should be thinking about what currently are the things that uh, could change if we had machine customers, what kind of new business opportunities we might have, and what are the things that might somehow get affected, either very negatively or very positively from the fact that it's machine customers. You know, machines are, they, like you said, they, they will try forever, for instance. In the, in the same fashion, they will be actually quite reliable customers in the sense that they will never forget to, to reorder, for instance, something. So there's always that. Um, <clears throat> but it really requires a new whole thinking that, that how do we start experimenting with machine, doing, doing things for machine customers? How do we, what kind of roadmap should we do? And, and then start, you know, experimenting and, and basically killing and, and killing those things that don't work and, and then mm. move forward with, with the things that do work. And another thing is that you need to have somebody who's responsible for all of this. You have to have a C CTO who's, uh, who's there to, to do all, all, all they can with, what he can or mm. she can with their, uh, the, their uh, team to enable these uh, services to be able mm -hmm. to you know service um, machine customers and most importantly i think it, it is about the cx professionals and, and practitioners understanding that what are these customer journeys going to be like what kind of changes will we need for our own internal processes what kind of uh, new training do we need to give to our people so that they understand uh, what's happening here and i'm kind of torn as, as a CX uh, enthusiast in, 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 in the sense that, at, that on, on one side, I'm, I'm very much supporting that, okay, we need to think about customers' feelings and we need to, you know, deliver on, on, on the CX strategies that we create based on, 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 on the feelings that we want to, you know, get our customers to think. But on, at the same time, I see this technology that is coming, but I, I think that we should always keep in mind that uh, there are like uh, things that machine customers can do by themselves, but there are also things where they will need to um, involve the, the, the end customers anyhow, if things say don't go exactly as planned or something like that. So there's always these scenarios where the human customer will be still needed uh, at, at one end of the, of the journey. Uh, and then this kind of balance, if you like, uh, between how do you service human customers and, and these machine customers. And that, that's a completely different skill set. Hmm. So obviously machines don't experience things, do they? Not yet. Not, anyway. yet, not, not yet, at least. <laughs> not that we know of. And unless they become sentient, I don't know if, if then maybe. God, that's not that's a scary thing to think about. <laughs> um, well, I guess it's interesting. Um, it's a potential impact of G Chat GPT that um, could have a far-reaching impact, particularly on the contact center industry. Mm. Um, I think it's great that you've raised it. Um, I hear that it's going to be published in CX5, is that correct? Customer Experience 5, yes, that's correct. Yeah, so you'll be writing no more about that. <laughs> yep. Um, and yeah, I'm sure we'll be hearing more from you on places like um, LinkedIn. So that's it for today, Serta. Thank you so much. Uh, if you had like one piece of advice or a takeaway to leave the audience with today, what would that be? Go out there, be bold, uh, be creative. Don't let the machines rule this world. <laughs> Not yet, but anyways. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So potentially scary future ahead, isn't it? When you think about the potential application of sentient artificial intelligence. <laughs> um, so thank I you so much that. for joining us today, Serta. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be invited. Thank you. Uh, 
you're welcome and thank you so much to everybody who listened or watched along wherever you are bye for now thanks for listening to the inspiring women in cx podcast with me claire musket if you enjoyed the episode and you don't already please 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 do drop us a like and subscribe to our channel the bigger the following the bigger the impact we can create on our mission to amplify the voices of women working in cx and technology well that's all for now join us again next time where i'll be talking to the incredible ever davenport cx senior transformation director at Cantar, about breaking down barriers imposter syndrome and workplace bias See you all very soon.